This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 819, recorded on October 19th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 71 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the middle of October, <laughs> and there's some wispy clouds, and 71 Fahrenheit is about the same as 20 Celsius. It's 18C here, completely sunny, very nice, but chilly, and it goes down into the single digits cent- centigrade uh, during the night. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here on an atypical day for me, but I'm switching to Tuesdays now for TWIV. Um, and uh, 64 Fahrenheit, 18C, so about the same weather as New York and just lovely blue skies and autumn leaves turning and cluttering up the lawn already. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. 81 degrees, a little bit of sunshine. Uh, for us, that's a quite pleasant. It's a not not uncomfortable to be outside. Works for me. It's a lovely day, lovely full day. Yeah, d- Alan, is this your first Tuesday twiv? I think I did a Tuesday really early on before I decided I was only going to do once a week, and I picked Friday. Um, and then because of child transportation scheduling issues, Fridays were just turning into a real mess. So. Um, Tuesdays it is. As a Tuesday has a different feel. Yeah. You know, Friday is kind of like closure, right? TWIV yeah. is the last thing you d- I do anyway before leaving, typically. Well, sometimes we do a TWIP. Um, so, yeah, well, you'll get used to it. People get used to anything, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Initially, yeah. the change is hard, but, yeah. I mean, it's just another day. It's just another TWIV. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have a paper for you today, but first... Kathy has an AS, a public service announcement for us. Actually, Rich's. Oh, it's that's in Rich's. green. It's in green. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it, you know, uh, it, it is as much Kathy as anything else. So I just want to um, uh, remind people that the ASV Education Town Hall meetings are still ongoing. ASV.org slash education. If you look there right now, you'll see only uh, one that you can register for, and that's me and Priyan. Actually, by the time you get this, that might not even be the case uh, because Priyan and I are on Wednesday night. Uh, But I had a a talk with uh, Dan, a long talk with Dan Engel, the creator of this, uh, yesterday, where he was wondering, you know, how it was going. I think he was getting a little discouraged because it's, you know, it's hard to reach people. Um, and, uh, I encouraged him, you know, don't give up. Let's keep going. You've put a lot of, a lot of investment into this and, uh, we will, uh, reinvigorate our efforts to reach people. Hence this public service announcement and, um, we'll, uh, you know, ping the experts once again and line people up. So keep your eye on it and the uh, registration schedule will, uh, fill up again and uh, we'll keep at it. And I would say to the TWIV audience, um, you know, uh, I think the TWIV audience probably needs this less than almost anybody. Yeah. Uh, but they probably know people. They definitely know people. Who could benefit from it. We all know it. people who would benefit and from it. And I've this. had several I've had several people who uh, have come on who themselves uh, were, you know, not vaccine hesitant, but want to... Um, uh, air some of the questions that they're getting from friends of theirs that are vaccine hesitant. Um, and uh, I understand that completely and we can uh, try and help with that. So, uh, you know, don't give up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, vax- vaccination is the way out of this. It's the safest way out of this. I would say what I have said before is that um Those who are hesitant should understand that uh, the virus is not going away. And you will become immune someday, somehow. 
And your chances of getting out of it unharmed are much better if your uh, uh, path to immunity is a vaccination. So. All right. Now, I've been slowly moving things down here from my office and I discovered under my table a big box that Lisa Smith had sent me last year. Now, Lisa Smith was one of the two surgeons from Chattanooga that we had on TWIV. And she sent me a whole bunch of stuff and among them were pads and I always need a pad next to me. Uh, and this one has things to do at the top, but at the bottom, you probably can't see it. It says, not all heroes wear capes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, University Surgical Associates, I guess that's their their company. And then at the top, it says, chest wall reconstruction program, Dr. Lisa Smith. Ooh, <laughs> Ooh that's very serious Ooh. stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want my chest reconstructed. So thank you for the pads and there's also a I got a t-shirt. I don't know what it's what's on the t-shirt. I'll have to show that next time. I got hand sanitizer, got masks, I got surgical scrubs, socks, pull the 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 long ones that uh, squeeze your vessels on planes. What are those called? Oh yeah, yeah, support support, support socks yeah. or Yeah, which I, I wear all the time actually. Uh, I got used to them while lecturing. I decided to wear them and they're kind of comfortable. But they, they have it with their company <laughs> on it and stuff. So thank you, Dr. Smith and the other doctor whose name is escaping me um, for, for a nice box of stuff. <laughs> Not all heroes wear capes. It just reminds me of the, the what is that, the, the uh, cartoon um, – where the the lady designed capes for superheroes. Oh, the Incredibles. The Incredibles, right. and the guy comes and he wants a cape, and she says, "No capes. They get caught no in things." <laughs> 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 and then she says, "All my these heroes. One of them flew next to a plane, and the cape got right. caught." <laughs> <laughs> no capes. No capes. <laughs> okay, so today we have one paper for you, so we can dwell on it, and it's sort of following up the uh, Fridays discussion about um, molnupiravir and uh, mutagenesis. I've had since then uh, a back and forth with uh, the, the, the senior author on the paper, Ron Swanstrom, and then apparently he and Merck have gone back and forth. So we'll talk about that on Friday. But here's another drug. This one, of course, uh, is um, an FDA-approved drug for treating COVID, remdesivir. So the paper is in Nature Communications, and the title is Mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 Polymerase Stalling by Remdesivir. And yes, a polymerase can stall just like your car, <laughs> your yes. car can stall. It's a great word. Um, the, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five co-first authors, Goran Koshik, Hauke Hillen, Dmitry Teganov, Christian Dineman, and Florian Seitz. Then we have Schmitzova, Farnug, Seward, Hobartner, and Kramer. And they are from uh, the Max Planck in Göttingen, the University Medical Center in Göttingen. Is that how you say it, Kathy? Göttingen? Göttingen. Göttingen. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like an R, Göttingen. Göttingen. Yeah, the University of Würzburg. Um, uh, and so... This is a nice little mechanistic paper that I, appealed to me greatly. So uh, it, kind of, it explains the mechanism by which uh, remdesivir inhibits uh, the polymerase. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus polymerase uh, is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP. There's a catalytic part, and then there are two other proteins that are required for uh, polymerization. And uh, the the way these uh, polymerases work, of course, is that the template, very much like other RNA polymerases, the template feeds in. We just did RNA synthesis on Monday in uh, Virology Live. The template threads in, goes past the, past the active site, and then in the active site or the catalytic site, the nucleotides are brought. There's a separate channel for nucleotides, nucleoside triphosphates, and uh, they are brought in. And they base pair with the template to make a product. And then you have a 
template product there. Uh, and um, the, <clears throat> the active site is ordered. It has place, it's kind of like a ribosome with three sites, right? There are sites in the enzyme for bases. It's kind of like a ladder, I guess. Um, so the very three prime end of the product RNA is in what's called the minus one site. And then the, new, the next triphosphate goes to the plus one site. It's attached covalently, of course. And there then, is no zero site. There, there is, is no, no zero, zero site. site. Minus one to plus one. Minus one. To, I, I wonder why. I guess that's just Biologists, right? not mathematicians, yeah. were coming up with this. And then when the covalent bond is formed, um, that triggers the RNA to move. And now the plus one is open against of the next base, so you can put a new base in that, right? So think of this, this duplex now, move back, and now you have a new plus one site. Is that good? Does that work for everybody? Yeah, you know, if you wanted to, it, it, as we were preparing for this, I think you and I were editing the document at the same time. And I put in this, I was looking for a picture of a transcription complex, a diagram. And I, the best I could do was a, a, a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. And I found this picture and I pasted it in. Then I scrolled down and discovered you'd done the same thing. Exactly the same picture. <laughs> And so then I no, took it, it out. it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't do oh, that. Oh, who was it that put that in? It wasn't me. Maybe Kathy? No. Oh. Uh oh. oh. <laughs> Maybe I did it twice. Halloween is coming up. I uh, could show and, that. And, I could yeah, show that. Yeah, if you could show that. Let's see. How do I mean, we... We're going to... I actually have a... Oh, okay. You got it. There's I, also... I, I, um, we can get to this later, but there's a... Um, there's a video in the supplementary oh, data. Oh, that's right. There is. Oh, yeah. The I video is the great. That you could probably bring up on your screen when we get to that point when we're talking about the mechanism that they talk about for remdesivir. So, so, so explain this, this is, in terms of an RNA polymerase, Rich. Excuse me. Make believe it's an RNA polymerase. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, the, the important features of this, uh, and sorry for those who are, we'll try and make this accessible for those who are not watching. Uh, but uh, the important features of this, there's. This particular diagram shows a uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, okay? So uh, it shows a brown oval blob. That's the polymerase. It's got some accessory proteins. Forget about it, okay? It's got a double-stranded DNA molecule that threads in from the front end and out the back end. Uh, if you want, that's got a, a blue and a gray strand in this diagram. If you just forget about the blue strand, then it's kind of, you'd have one strand and that's what the RNA template would look like in an RNA polymerase, okay? And then it's got the uh, nascent RNA molecule, okay, which in this diagram is red. Uh, and some of the, and uh, one of the most important points in my mind is that there is, a series of in DNA dependent RNA polymerases, probably about 10 to 12 base pairs, okay, where the newly synthesized RNA is base paired to the template, okay. And my guess is that in these viral RNA dependent RNA polymerases, it's at least similar, okay. And then there's also a tail of RNA uh, that uh, is not base paired but still inside the polymerase before it actually exits, okay? <clears throat> so you can have on the order of 20 nucleotides or so that are embedded in the RNA polymerase before it actually exits. And then right in the middle is the business end of this thing uh, where there is, and this is labeled as active site, which is right adjacent to the growing end of the RNA chain, which we call the three prime end that's a chemical way of, of referring to the growing end that refers to the chemistry of the, of the last base in the growing chain to which a new nucleotide is going to be added. And then on the front end, it's got a channel where the new single base, new nucleoside triphosphate would enter to combine with the growing chain and activate uh, and, and, and polymerize. And then once you add a new nucleotide, this whole thing moves forward one base, which then puts the growing end uh, in a 
in position to receive a new nucleotide. And so in this diagram, the, I guess the, well, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really label minus one and plus one, but minus one would be the already polymerized growing end. Plus one is the part of the enzyme that's going to receive the new nucleotide. So at least for poliovirus, the RNA remains duplex as it comes out and it actually makes a double-stranded RNA, which then the polymerase attaches to and copies just one strand and then makes a single strand. And then there are multiple polymerases on a double-stranded template, all shooting off single-stranded RNA. So I don't know how you, it's probably universal among RNA viruses, but I'm not sure. But it's interesting that here, we're, this is transcription, mRNA synthesis, right? So it's making a single-stranded mRNA. Okay, so that's the process of, and, and, and structures of coronavirus polymerases have been determined, and this is understood pretty well. And what they want to do in this paper is understand, in the context of this polymerase structure, how remdesivir works. Uh, remdesivir, as I said, the only FDA-approved drug, unfortunately not so great. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel Griffin, last uh, few weeks, has talked about some clinical studies. Uh, I guess the last one was the discovery trial. Remember, remdesivir had been around for a while. I guess it didn't work well with for Ebola, although it was attempted to be used with Ebola virus. It inhibited SARS-CoV-2 in cell cultures and in animals. So it was given, um, what, an EUA, I suppose, based on that without a clinical trial. And then, since then, clinical trials have been done. And in some of them, there appeared to be a faster time to recovery. But in this discovery trial, which is the most recent one, they say the faster time to recovery previously reported was not observed together with previous evidence. Results from discovery trial do not support the use of remdesivir in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in a population with symptoms for more than a week and requiring oxygen support. Yeah. So very specific. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that is the critical, in my mind, the critical feature of this is that this was uh, in, a, in a circumstance where people came to the hospital, so yeah. they're sick. And the average time from onset of symptoms to the start of remdesivir in this trial was nine days. And, you know, if people can think back on all our previous discussions on this, that's probably too late. That's too late. And the virus, I don't know. Is, the I, virus is not driving their pathology at that point. Yeah. And, and that's Daniel has gone into that. Um, so remdesivir, just a, a little bit of perspective on it. This was developed as a hepatitis C drug. And of course, in hepatitis C, you've got a chronic infection and you really, you, yeah, showing up late would be fine. You want to yeah. stop the virus. Um, and I'm not sure what its status is with hep C, actually. I haven't kept track of that, but. I don't think uh, it's, it one, is, I don't think it's one of the combinations that. Yeah, are used, it's not. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's generally included, but um, so this is a nucleoside analog. It, it's a fake nucleoside it looks like what does it look like adenosine let's i've got it uh vincent let's share, ah, it got yeah, it. I'll share but before we get into that i just wanted to say one more thing um part of the problem with remdesivir is that it has to be given intravenously right yes so <laughs> mostly it was given to people ending up in the hospital and as rich has said it's too late by then right yeah what you need is a pill for when you get yeah. your first yeah positive test and that's molnupiravir right. and others yes. as well so right. that's the uh, story there okay so it's it's got it's, it's i mean if you could give people an iv infusion <laughs> after they're positive it might work better but it's kind of hard to do well and this was this was also tested out so it's it's been thrown at other viruses and most most recently before the pandemic was ebola and my understanding is the results there were kind of yeah that's critical right too but that was in a middle of an emergency and so anyway okay here's this here are the structures yeah it's a it's a yeah. modified atp adenosine triphosphate right. so we talk about nucleoside analogs uh, all the time i thought it'd be nice to uh show what they actually look like it's hard to i had to dig around to find two comparable structures because there's 
uh, a lot of different ways to present these. And this is, this is what I uh, came up with. And this is the, for those who can look at this, what I've shown on the left is remdesivir triphosphate. That's not the actual drug. It's, uh, it is uh, administered as a prodrug where there's uh, just one phosphate group hanging off the uh, ribose uh, on, the, uh, on the left-hand side of this diagram, the other two terminal phosphates in the prodrug are not there. And instead, there's a bunch of other uh, rubbish uh, that uh, stabilizes it and makes it bioavailable. Uh, and then those get, it gets metabolized and that stuff gets removed and the other two triphosphates get added. So this is the direct precursor for synthesis. But I wanted to show this because... Um, and by the way, triphosphates don't get into cells very well. And that's why you need to administer this as a prodrug. Okay. Uh, so, and that's uh, compared to adenosine triphosphate. And what you can see is that the triphosphate's the same. The, uh, the uh, five-membered ring that has the oxygen in there, that's a ribose, is almost the same. But over on the right-hand side of what we call the one prime carbon on remdesivir triphosphate, there's a big honking uh, cyano group hanging on, a triple bonded nitrogen hanging off of that uh, carbon. And so that's a big bulky group, and that becomes important. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing to notice is the base, which is the thing in the upper right-hand corner that has a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring is slightly different in the remdesivir triphosphate. It's a different, uh, it's not really a, well, uh, no, it's not really a purine because uh, it's got the, uh, it's got the nitrogens in the wrong place. Okay. Yeah. But uh, in terms of functioning as a base, I think it functions pretty well. And my guess is the polymerase pretty much ignores that though. I don't know what sort of, um, experiments have been done to explore the contribution of that to the chemistry. But as we will see, what's really important is that big old cyano group that's hanging off the ribose. I, I do want to make one summary comment, and that is for people who are uh, tuned into this to remember, because we throw around the word nucleoside analog all the time. There are all sorts of drugs that inhibit polymerases. Okay, and nucleoside analog, the compounds we were looking at there are, are nucleosides, or at least the one on the right, adenosine triphosphate. An analog is something that looks a lot like it, so you can fool a polymerase. It thinks it's a nucleoside and, and tries to use it, but it's an analog. Yep. There are other compounds that inhibit polymerases that don't look like nucleosides, use different mechanisms, okay? Right, but the idea here is you're handing it a rubber cigar. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to make a comment on the chemistry here. So this prodrug is a f phosphoramidate, which basically means it's got a what looks like a phosphate hanging off the left side, as, as uh, Rich said. And the chemistry is such that normally it's a phosphate wouldn't get in very well, but the way the phosphate is positioned... It's taken up well. And the reason that's good is because if you give just the ribose with the base, the first phosphorylation takes a really long time, right? Mm -hmm. It's slow. It's rate limiting. So the second and third phosphate additions are faster. So by f the chemist figured out how to fool the, <laughs> the cell into thinking this is a real phosphate. And so that goes quicker. And there's a, I think cyclic phosphate is another way to it somehow fool the 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 cell into getting this in. Even though there's a phosphate there, it's somehow hidden in a way that it can be taken up. So that's a cool uh, development of just the last ten years or so, because um, many of the older drugs are they don't have any phosphates on them at all. I think uh, acyclovir has no phosphates. Acyclovir right? does not. But that's for acyclovir. Actually, that's part of the mechanism. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, the enzyme that puts on the first phosphate, which is uh, a nucleoside, uh, a nucleotide kinase, okay, that's part of the mechanism in herpes because the right. herpes uh, mm -hmm. enzyme recognizes right. acyclovir, right. whereas the cellular enzymes do not. Okay, right. but that's not right. that's not always the case. But AZT, right. in, in that case, you're actually you're actually fooling 
not only the polymerase, but also the herpes virus thymidine kinase. That's yeah. right. And AZT uh, doesn't have any phosphates either. And that is phosphorylated by cellular kinases. And that first step is very slow. But again, just to reiterate, if you had a phosphate there, it wouldn't get into the cell very well. But there's different chemistry, the phosphoramidate or the cyclic uh, phosphate gets around it somehow. Right. And the key with these is they are close enough to fool the viral lems enzyme, but the cellular enzymes are picky enough that they won't pick this up at a significant rate so that you're targeting the virus. Well, in this case, of course. In this case, it wouldn't, yeah. There's no cell <laughs> enzyme that that does this. Well, RNA I don't know. It's a good question. Oh. Is this, is this, do you think this would be utilized by Paul II? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, there must be experiments out there. I'm sure there's, I'm sure they've checked that. Yeah, they must have checked because the toxicity is good enough that it can be used in people, yeah. right? So it must not be. But to some extent, you know, if it's, uh, to some extent, you don't, in a situation like this where you're making RNA, where it's decidedly an RNA precursor. Uh, you know, who cares if you screw up a little bit of transcription? You just throw those RNAs away and start over again, okay? Uh, as long as you're not making bad copies of DNA, okay? Well, if you... It depends how much, cells, it depends, yeah, it depends how much you inhibit the mRNA synthesis, right? If you yeah. completely block it because you're stalling. But I don't, I'm right. sure it doesn't do that. Anyway, so as as Alan said, this, this uh, remdesivir triphosphate, RTP, is taken up by the coronavirus polymerase. And this is cool. It's incorporated into the growing chain, and then the RNA extends by three nucleotides, and it stalls. Right, three, and they point out that for counteth e only to three. Thou shalt three, not go to four. three. <laughs> but for Ebola virus, it happens after five bases, five nucleotides, which I I didn't know. That's very cool. And so this, obviously the enzymes are slightly different. And in the end, you'll fit, you'll see when they sort out the mechanism that Ebola, the architecture, the active site must be slightly different. So that's what they want to know here. Why does this stall? Um, and they do some very nice biochemistry and structural biology. There's no vaccines here, folks. There's no antibodies or T cells. There's no <laughs> variants. This is pure biochemistry and structural biology. And, yeah. and for those of you <laughs> who started listening in the pandemic and have a more practical bent, you might be asking, well, the stuff doesn't work. Who cares how the mechanism operates? And the answer there is, well, don't we want to know why it doesn't work? Don't we want to have insight on how this thing should be working, how it stops the enzyme, um, and maybe come up with better ones? Now, in the case of remdesivir and SARS-CoV-2, we pretty much know why it doesn't work in the way that it's been used, which is that it's being given too late. I mean, that's part of what's going on. Um, but we would like to have maybe general purpose inhibitors of coronavirus polymerases. So when the next coronavirus comes out of the woods outside my house, um, we'll, we'll be able to have these drugs in waiting. Uh, and to do that, we need to know exactly how they work. And so that's what this is delving into. Plus, the, the, um, the, one of the major issues here is that it's not orally bioavailable. Yes. Okay? So if you understand the mechanism, and you understand, as we'll get, well, if you understand what the mechanism it is, it could be that you can make something that structurally would work the same way, but be orally bioavailable. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then yes, you we, can we have, have your orally bioavailable nucleoside analogs. Yeah. So that's theoretically possible. So then maybe you can have your pills at home. And when your right. uh, positive COVID test came up, you could start taking the pills and maybe it would be effective. So or the if, the pills are, if the pills are benign enough, maybe just when you start coughing. Yeah. All right. So the first thing they do is reproduce this stalling in vitro, in their in vitro system. Um, what they call a highly defined biochemical system. They have uh, the, the polymerase and they can add a substrate, which is a, a synthetic RNA, which is partially double-stranded. You have to think, think of a hairpin, right? It's got a little loop at one end and along the body of the hairpin, except that this hairpin, you know, most hairpins, the part that you put in your hair is the, the, the two parts of the same length, but this one is broken 
because it's only partially double-stranded. And then what the polymerase is going to do is they add this to the polymerase and then the polymerase will start filling it in. And because this RNA is so small, they can run it on a gel and watch it. The polymerase put one and two and three bases, the most I, I gorgeous gels. I love this gels. classic biochemistry approach. This is like from 40 years ago, this experiment. Let's just, <laughs> let's make the, and have it prime and we'll track it on a gel to see stepwise how the bases get added. And that's what they do. It's beautiful. Well, yeah. they, so one so one thing I noticed that I really like is that the uh, the this probe, the you know the hairpin template primer, is fluorescently labeled. Yeah. <laughs> and back in the old days, we would have done this with P thirty two, right? It would have been hot. Okay. So yeah. uh, you know, first of all, you don't have to deal with radioactivity. Second, you can label a bunch of this stuff up and stick it in the freezer forever. P thirty two has a half life of two weeks, so you got to get your experiments done. Yeah. Right. So many problems with P32 besides the health hazards. You have to dispose it. We had a whole radiation safety, right? Every university oh, yeah. radiation oh. safety for purchasing, for disposal. 55 gallon drums of radioactive waste going yep. to some landfill. This is so much better. Now, the good thing about that two week half life is that when you spill it on your shoes and they're ridiculously <laughs> hot, you can just put them in a drawer for you know, a few months. And yeah, then you, can yeah, you can't shoes. do that with C14 or tritium. No. Right? no. And but one nice thing about this figure is that above each of the lanes, they have pictorially indicated what's been added in that particular reaction. Yeah. So you can almost look at the picture without even having to read the figure legend. Yeah. I, I like that. It is, it is a very yeah. nicely designed figure, yes. yeah. And because the template is short and they know the sequence, they can say, okay, if we add only A, it's just going to go one base because the next base is a C. And that's exactly what you see on the gel. <laughs> and yep. you could add A and G. And you can add all the bases. And the maximum you get is 11 bases added, right? Because that's, there's no more. There's no more of the hairpin. Um, and then they, they add RTP, remdesivir triphosphate. Uh, and you can see at, at low concentrations of... Uh, NTP, you get a, a, an elongation barrier after three nucleotides are added. So um, in the um, third lane, they have U, G, and R, and it only goes three, three bases. And then if they add higher concentrations, say of R, G, U, C, four bases, it will go up to 11, as they say. So the barrier can be overcome at high NTPs. It's interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that's part of the reason it doesn't work as as that well in people, maybe. Is there are a lot of NTPs around. So that's the, they reproduce this finding that uh, you put in remdesivir, the polymerase adds three bases and that's it. It stops. It stalls. All right. So why? And, and well, and the way you see that stalling actually is that you have that band all the way across that doesn't make it to 11. You see that four, even when right. you added right. all four nucleotides. Right, to four and yeah, you can see that. And you may say, how do I know it's four? Because they have one, they have two, they have three, and they have four bases. Yeah. They're all slightly uh, slower migrating. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is beautiful. It's a beautiful experiment. Yeah. And they, they also show it in graph form uh, on, the, on the right, the, the percent of full length product and you can see when you uh, add the remdesivir, it's 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 very low. But if you increase the concentration of the four, it goes up at higher concentrations. Beautiful. It's very nice. And it almost looks like a P32 gel, right? Because the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the bands are black. All right. So then they say, we're going to do some structure and see what's going on here. <laughs> They're going to actually make a template and mix it with the polymerase and solve the structure uh, by cryo EM, just I mean, this is just great. So they um, chemically synthesize uh, RNA oligonucleotides, and um, and they put the remdesivir monophosphate at specific positions in the sequence. So it's a similar template that we've talked about before, except it's uh, um, it's now incorporating ahead of time the RTP. 
So they put it uh, at two different places, right? The third, the third and the fourth position uh, on the template. Um, how can I explain that in a way that makes sense? So there are two remdesivir containing RNAs. Uh, one has the remdesivir at the minus three, which will be the minus three position in the polymerase. And then the other has it at the minus four. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or uh, the remdesivir in, in the minus three one uh, on the what what looks like the growing strain, you have a re remdesivir and then two more nucleotides. Right. In the minus four one, you have remdesivir and then three more nucleotides. And yes, essentially right. the question is, if you feed this to the polymerase, what happens? how does it position it? In the M time. And, and this is okay. not a, this is not a hairpin, right? This is a template product right. pair, right. right? So they synthesize uh one strand with remdesivir, then they, they have the other strand that they hybridize to it. Right. 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 So the, the reason they're doing it this way is because to get a cryo EM structure, you need a sample that's all the same thing. Yeah. Right. right. So if they took um in theory the samples from their previous experiment, you've got a mix where the remdesivir is in position one, two, three, four. Um, and you can bias that, but you'd still have other yeah. products in there that would mess up your structure. So for the cryo EM, they want a pure, what is going on when the remdesivir is in position three? And then they've got that sample and then they'd make one where it's all going to be in position four. So they're, they're essentially building models chemically and then solving the structures of them. And they have a critical control here, uh, which is, uh, a, a a template primer molecule that looks like the one that has the remdesivir followed by three nucleotides uh, that is in a minus four position, only instead of remdesivir, they put in the normal nucleotide. Okay, right. And so a critical question here is, does the polymerase see those two molecules differently? So go to the, okay, previous, go to the previous page where they make it. Um, okay. first. Yeah, so there, you might have to blow it up, but they actually show you the synthesis of this. <laughs> I think they're very proud of it because it was probably yes. not easy. <clears throat> um, but at the bottom there of figure two, that's the template product um, uh, yes. duplex that they're feeding to the polymerase. And they show it there with either A or R at the, that's the minus four position, right? right. And then they would make another one with the R at the, at the minus three, correct? Yep. So if we go down here, let me, uh, okay. So this looks good, I think. Yeah. So uh, the structure number one, again, got the template. Can you see my cursor moving around? Yep, here? yep. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, you got the template on the top and the, what would be the nascent or the analog of the growing strand on the bottom, and you see the R at position minus three. And then uh, the second structure has the R at position minus four, and the control structure has the A at position minus four. And the question, they feed the enzyme these three different molecules. And the question is, when you look at the structure, how does the enzyme bind those things? And as long as I'm here, the answer is that in structure one, it binds that so that the R is in fact in the minus three site and the active site at plus one is unfilled. It's open. It's available for a nucleotide. Right. Um, and let's go down to the control. Uh, uh, on, the, on the bottom where you have the A instead of the R at minus four, when it grabs onto that, it actually puts that A in the minus four slot in the enzyme so that once again, the active site is available, okay? But if you have, instead of that A, a remdesivir on the fourth nucleotide from the end, when it grabs onto that, it grabs onto it differently. Instead of putting that R in the minus four site in the enzyme, it puts it in the minus three site. So now we have the three prime end of the growing chain, which in this case is a G, sitting in the active site which blocks the active site from accepting a new nucleotide. Uh, so the, re so the I, reason they can't go it, with the remdesivir at minus four, something must be blocking it, right? Right. Otherwise, and what they 
the the process uh, ordinarily, you know, when you catalyze the addition of a nucleotide, the enzyme then moves. That's called translocation. Okay, and it opens up that uh, uh, acceptor site at plus one again. And this thing, one interpretation of this is that with the remdesivir at minus three, it cannot translocate. Okay. Uh, thinking about this, I decided that it was constipated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can't move. So, so can't. now show them the bottom. Okay. Well, okay. Oh, I was going to say, be sure you did that. I was going to have you look at the figures on in part B where they actually show oh, yes. um, the active yes. site is the dotted line. And you can see in structure one and the controls, control structure three, it's available. Right. But in structure two, it's blocked. So it's showing you in 3D stick models the same thing that the left side in A is showing you, that the G is blocking, uh, is, is in that active site. Yeah. And then down on the bottom, they have a, a, a model that shows why it is in their interpretation that you can't get the translocation, uh, which is looking over on the left, it shows the remdesivir uh, group uh, in purple. And what's highlighted here is what we pointed out to start with is that big old nitrogen uh, triple bonded to the carbon on the ribose. So that's this great big group that's not ordinarily there. And when you try and translocate with that in the minus three position to minus four, it crashes in to the hydroxyl on a serine in the enzyme at, uh, at uh, amino acid 861. So there's a what they call a steric clash or a steric hindrance. They and it basically hit. can't do it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it can't move that far because that cyano group is in the way. And one of the things that I found fascinating is that they said that they know from mutagenesis that if instead of that serine, you have an alanine, which instead of a uh, methyl and a hydroxyl hanging off of the alpha carbon of the amino acid is just the methyl group, that you can, there's, you can get a little, you can get more polymerization. That, that polymerase is slightly resistant. And if you have it set a glycine, which in the uh, enzyme has no side chain, okay, there's nothing to be in the way of, this, uh, of the uh, cyano group and it can slip past and that uh, polymerase is resistant. They know all this stuff. Yes. It's incredible. It's great. And, and a, lot of, a lot of biochemistry gets pretty subtle, but this is actually a really easy concept, right? Yeah. You take this aftermarket part that's got a, a thing sticking out the side where the original didn't, and it runs into another part of your machinery, and it can't go any further. And, uh, for listeners, you know, if you want to look up this paper, I think it's open access, right? It is, yeah. Uh, if you want to look up this paper, these figures are so well done. They're very well that done, That in particular, yes. if you follow along with uh, this discussion, I think you'll get it. You think uh, uh, you want to play the movie there, uh, Rich? Uh, yeah, let me see. I I'd think put the I link in the show notes. I think I've got... Or yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, no, Kathy's, I, Kathy's got the link here. We can go to the movies now. Yeah. Yes. I've got I've got the movie up. If, go. Oh, you can you can go. Uh, just go. share your screen have... and play it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me just rewind the movie. It's it auto played. Um, <laughs> it's forty one seconds long. Okay, I'm going to share. <laughs> Here's the structure, and they're showing. We're zooming in now. Here's the elongating strand. There on the left is this serine. We're going to put the remdesivir in. Now on the minus one site, we're going to add onto our growing chain. Oh, it's so beautiful it too. And we're going to add on. Brilliant. Everything's going fine. We're just going to move the chain along. Oh Let's my go ahead gosh. and add the fourth one. And uh, yep, just a nice day here in the Clash. Bam. Clash. Oh my gosh, what's going on? What's going on here? Did you guys cheap out on the parts again? That's and great. There we go. It's yeah, so beautiful. clear. It's, it's so clear. Yes. <laughs> And so that's how the RNA moves through the active site, right? It comes out. Yes. Beautiful. 
Now, they make an interesting point. Remember, uh, this polymerase has a uh, proofreading function, very unusual, the, the nidovirales. They have an exonuclease mm -hmm. that can do some proofreading. And so they say that um, it says here that the stalled state, the product three prime nucleotide is buried in the active center and is base paired with the template strand, as we saw in the movie. This may explain why the three prime N may be, be at least partially escape proofreading by the exo. The exo needs a single strand to chew back. And if this is double stranded, it may uh, be somewhat resistant. So, in other words, the exo should correct this. <laughs> putting remdesivir in, but it doesn't always. They say there is some correction, um, but it's not 100% as you might expect. Uh, and they say maybe that's why the drug isn't so good uh, because there is some correction of the error, of yeah. the incorporation of uh, RTP, right? So, so one of the error correction mechanisms in uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and I, we'd ha I'd have to talk to um, Dennison, Mark Dennison, uh, uh, about this and the uh, proofreading by this polymerase, either plus and minus the proofreading function. But in DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, one mechanism, this blows my mind, is that the enzymes can actually back up, okay? And they can back up between 10 and 20 nucleotides. So the three prime end is now, I don't know where that goes, where it goes out the nucleotide channel or whatever, but it's hanging loose. Okay, yeah, it's no yeah. longer in the active site. And then the actual active site of the enzyme can then cleave that oh. about, about uh, you know, 10 to 12 nucleotides. It's a variable number of nucleotides, but a fair number of nucleotides upstream from the th three prime end and throw that whole uh, three prime end away. And, and now it has a new three prime end in the active site and start over again. <laughs> okay, that's, a, that's not an uncommon thing for a... DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that has misincorporated a nucleotide, okay? It gets a little beyond that. The helix in the enzyme doesn't feel right, so it backs up, cleaves that off, and tries again, okay? Whether that happens in this, they mention that. They say such removal of several RNA nucleotides may require uh, RNA backtracking along the uh, polymerase, yeah. and this may be induced by the viral helicase NSP13. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. a possibility. Which reminds me a lot of my it, writing yeah. process. So it would unwind. It would un the helicase would unwind the duplex and the exo. Right. And the, the yeah. interesting part is that the exo is is situated next to the polymerase. It's not in the active site. So maybe when it backtracks, the it gets unwound and then it's stuck Could out, be. and the exo can cut it off. That would be cool. So this is uh, almost as good a movie as the plaque assay, I would say. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, a great it's movie. It's awesome. It's really great. Great paper. Now, really nice. The the final thing they say is the mechanistic insights presented here, and now we understand why it stalls after three bases. And and by the way, in Ebola, it must be that there's more room and it hits something further up in the channel. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Um. So they say the, the mechanistic insights may facilitate search for compounds with improved potential. So I'm trying to think, what could you do? Um, because this is pretty good that it blocks, but it gets edited out apparently uh, to a certain extent. Would you make something that can go further in the channel, you think? And it wouldn't be less likely to be um, correct. I don't know what the chemists would do. Probably just try stuff and see if how it works, right? <laughs> yes, that is one approach. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't want you to think this is the only mechanism of inhibition. Apparently, there's another paper um, published, in what was it, in Journal of Biological Chemistry, uh, where they say, so the remdesivir is incorporated, as you see here, and they say if... If nucleotide concentrations are high, there won't be this stalling. So you could get a bunch of remdesivirs incorporated into the complementary strand, and then when that's copied, that could be there could be issues in copying the remdesivir, and there could be clashes in the active site at the copying of the strand the second time where the remdesivir has been incorporated. So it, there may there's maybe more than one. Uh, mechanism besides the one we've talked about here today. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I really like really it. Lovely. Yeah. Neat work. It's, it's yeah. lovely. It is absolutely lovely. Check it out. And this um, 
is going to go into the antiviral lecture. This is just just yeah. beautiful. Yeah, this oh, paper and came out in January of 2021. Right. So it's been out there yeah. for a while. Yeah, they kind of always got trumped by antibodies and vaccines and variants. Right. But now um, I thought, especially following up molnupiravir, that this would be a good one. So yeah. this lost to molnupiravir on Friday, but today <laughs> it's, <laughs> it won it. So the, the, the technology boggles the mind. It's amazing, when I, yeah. When I retired uh, six years ago, I think the structure of the VSV, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, had not yet, it was just being done. Mm -hmm. That was uh, Sean, Sean Whalen. Whalen. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember I was on study section with yeah. him, and he told me that they'd uh, uh, just about done it, and I think it was published about the time I retired, and that was a cryo-EM study. So we didn't even have cryo-EM structures of these types of polymerases six years ago. Okay, the type of biochemistry that's done here uh, has been a, has been around yeah. uh, for a while. That's not uh, at all to diminish its sophistication because it's phenomenal. But to be able then now six years later to combine that biochemistry with three different structures of the enzyme and the template together is mind boggling. Yeah, if you just did the biochemistry, it wouldn't tell you the mechanism, right? It just says it right. stops after That's three. Right. We don't know why. You need the structure. That's, right. That's the key to this paper for right. sure, yeah. right? Gorgeous. 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 Okay. And I also, I just want to call out this line <laughs> at the beginning of the methods section. No statistical methods were used to predetermine sample size. The experiments were not randomized, and the investigators were not blinded to allocation during experiments and outcome assessment. <laughs> That's great. We don't need statistics to tell this. <laughs> no, we don't. All right, let's do some email. Kathy, can you take the first one? Sure. Lori writes, hello, Twivers, 75F, 24C, and reigning in Tomball, Texas. I really enjoyed the interview with Moshe Arditi and Yvette Bahar. I don't know very much about super antigens, but maybe we'll learn more about them as I continue to listen to past TWIV episodes. I'm at 288 and still have almost 300 episodes to go before I'm caught up. I was thinking about the possible connection of super antigens, HLA, a neuropathology that was discussed in episode 815, and I'm wondering if a similar mechanism could partially explain why the polio virus can cause paralysis in some individuals. As well, could you explain reassortment versus recombination? Is reassortment a type of recombination, but recombination is not necessarily reassortment? Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Lori. So um, I'll tackle the reassortment versus recombination <laughs> um, if you want. I'll do that yeah, now. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so um, imagine that you had uh, pieces of rope, clothesline if you want, and um, you had a red one and a white one. And if you were able to cut one apart and cut the other one apart and then put the red half with the white half and the white half with the red half, that would be what we would call recombination. If, on the other hand, you started with different pieces of rope, and, we're, and these pieces of rope here are um, nucleotide strands is what they're standing for. But if you had... Uh, pieces of rope that, uh, again, we can have our white one and our red one, and you have a whole bunch of white ones in, cut up in different size pieces. Um, that would, if you had eight of them, that would be symbolic of an influenza virus particle where there's eight pieces of RNA. And then you had another one that had eight red pieces of RNA. And if both of those uh, infected a cell, you could have some of the red pieces and some of the white pieces come together um, in a new progeny virus that would come out of that cell. And that would be reassortment. So you've taken the different pieces and reassorted them, but you haven't recombined them. Re so. so recombined implies on the same strand. Right. And it, it, it implies actually cutting a cutting and cutting and, and rejoining with another, rather and some, than just carrying a different collection <clears throat> of strands with you. Some viruses only have one strand. Yeah, 
So if you're going to get any sort of mixing up of markers, that has to be a recombination event. Other viruses have multiple strands. Flu is the classic, okay? In which case, they can just reassort. Now, flu actually <clears throat> can do both. Is that correct? Uh, can you get uh, some? Is there no, no, no. recombination? I guess so that's the, right. The, it's these, negative stranded. So these, the negative strand viruses right. don't seem to recombine. And, and reports of recombination are actually sequence artifacts. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, as far, that's what I have been told by the negative strand virologists. Uh, I'm, as far as the polio question goes, it's a good question. What what causes, you know, one in 100 or 200 people to get paralyzed? Doesn't There's no super antigen in the genome. It doesn't seem to be HLA dependent. So people have looked at that and there's no correlation of specific HLA, um, you know, the, the major histocompatibility antigens on the cell surface with polio. Uh, but... Um, so, no one has done a one one group in Denmark did a GWAS. They took people who had polio and they looked to see if there were any single nucleotide polymorphisms that correlated with them being paralyzed. A GWAS is a genome wide association study. It's relatively easy to do. You get people. It doesn't matter when they were paralyzed. You get them, and you just take blood and you do their genome sequence, and they found potentials, uh, polymorphisms in multiple genes, not HLA. But I think given what we know about um, polio in, in, in laboratory animals, that most likely polymorphisms in the innate immune system genes are going to be probably the ones that correlate with, with paralysis, right? If you knock out interferon type 1 receptor in mice, Virus reproduces like gangbusters everywhere, not just in the tissues that are typical for polio reproduction. So I suspect that um, that's going to be part of it. And Julie, Julie Pfeiffer at, uh, in Dallas has done some experiments to support that as well. So that's, but uh, I'm not sure how much this will be worked on given that. Yeah. <laughs> the two out of three serotypes of polio are eradicated and. Yeah, we're, we're running happen. out of we're, we're running out of subjects to yeah. look at this in, and the animal models don't necessarily recapitulate it very accurately. And I've always kind of wondered if um, the gut microbiome might be involved. It's another like, possibility, yeah, because there's a tremendous question, amount of variability in that. Yeah, and maybe if you have the wrong bugs in your gut when you get polio, you get more likely. I mean, paralysis. I think the other interesting question is. Why do one in one and a half million kids get polio from the vaccine, right? From the vaccine. That's right. A, that's a really rare polymorphism, most likely. And the, the, the Danish group didn't look at that. They, I, I suggested that they look at it and they thought it was a good idea, but they, they only looked at people who got polio from wild type circulating virus. It's It would be very hard to get signal out of that level of, I mean, you've, you've got so few patients. Well, uh, maybe it'd be hard to collect them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? John writes, hi, first some background. My wife and I are vaccinated. We both volunteered to give out the vaccines. Good for you. Naturally, my five-year-old isn't vaccinated yet. I saw that Pfizer had applied for authorization in five to 12-year-olds based on a random controlled trial of 3,000 children. I hesitate to ask as I don't want to give fodder to the anti-vaxxers, but I was wondering, will we be able to tell the difference in risk between COVID and the Pfizer vaccine based on this study? The risk of severe outcomes for children in those age groups is so low that in a study of only 3,000, there may not even be a severe adverse event in either leg. Thus, how can parents know if the vaccine or COVID is worse? Is there other information that will also come out that clearly shows which is safer? Or maybe this uh, in this study, there will be data that correlates to severe outcomes. Or, thanks, John. Uh, and frankly, uh, I don't know the answer to this question. I, I have not seen the data. I would have to see the data. But the question is entirely appropriate. Yeah, and I would assume that part of the... Uh, FDA's evaluation of this, in fact, is a risk-benefit analysis. Yes. Okay, uh, and that based on the sorts of questions 
that you're asking, they have looked at data and determined that the benefit outweighs the risk in the case of the vaccine. But I can't, I can't attest to that personally because I haven't seen the data. Anybody else? These trials are generally structured so that the end point is a certain number of events. Yeah. So they enroll their 3,000 people and they say, okay, when we have this, our statisticians tell us when we have this number of events, however we're defining our outcomes, then we can unblind the data and look at it and see if we got more events in the control or the or the um, vaccinate group. And it's going to depend on what they used as outcomes. I'm assuming that because of exactly this point, I mean, this is really an excellent question and gets to the heart of the difficulty of setting up a pediatric trial for this virus um, or, you know, for the vaccine. And a, a major a major thing to look at would be, say, infections, right? And I'm hoping that we'll get some data on infection. If you've reduced infection rate, that would obviously count as significant efficacy for the vaccine. Um, you'd be looking at antibody titers. You'd be looking at correlates of immunity. Um, since we have all the adult data and ongoing adult data, we can draw comparisons between those and say, okay, we're getting robust antibody responses in the kids, if that's what the, sh the data show. Um, and we're going to say that that is indicating that that the vaccine is probably working. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're not going to have nearly as many, you're not going to have a lot of hospitalizations. You're not going to have, I mean, hope, hopefully you don't have any deaths, but you're not going to have a lot of them in any case in this group. Um, so I guess they would be looking at things like severity of illness. You know, some of these kids are going to get sick. And the question is how sick. And I think we'll have to wait to see what the data show. Yeah, in adults, the myocarditis is like 40 per million, something like that, right after the vaccine. Right. So these numbers, no, they're not going to pick that up. But what Daniel has said is that after it's given EUA, they're going to continue to monitor it and accumulate yes. more data as is being done now in adults. So we'll get that. I mean, the key now is that it's an emergency. We need to get kids vaccinated, right? Same, yeah. we had to get adults vaccinated. And then after the fact, we collect the data. That's all you can do. If you're worried, then you're not going to yeah. vaccinate your kids, right? But I think because it's so different, vaccine versus COVID in adults, it's likely to be similar in children. But the numbers are hard to get right now. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that there, I, I would imagine that there's a certain amount of reliance too on the safety profile in uh ages 12 and up as well. Yes. Because it's so remarkably safe. Yes. All right. That unless there are some real big surprises in the younger population as they do this trial, the, they, they, you know, lean on that, those other observations to some extent. Yeah. I had, I just realized I have one of these tiles on my desk. I can show it to you. <laughs> Excellent. So like we got purple, green, and gray in, a, in an array on the wall. It's like a 20 by 20 matrix. It looks like a, a flat caps it. <laughs> Although the sad part is to, there are no pentamers. They're only hexamers because these are oh. <laughs> hexagons. I wanted to see pentamers and, hexa, pentamers and hexamers or pentagons and hexamers. Anyway, it looks really cool. And it's well, just, since, you're, <laughs> since you're tessellating a flat surface, you yes. can do it all with, tessell with hexagons. So right? actually, yeah. To make a capsid, you'd have to remove one every now and then to get yes. at the curve. And that's where you would get the pentamers. That's where you need the pentamers. This is uh, s uh, foam for um, the sound The sound bounces. It just deadens echoes, right? So, Alan, you have a choice between this really short one or the really long one. You, uh, <laughs> it's your pick. You can do the short one or you can do the long one. Um, oh, actually, I could, I could do both if you want. Okay, go ahead. The short one is really, really short. So Anne writes, among Dr. de Pombier's many notable accomplishments, this one is also noteworthy and links to an article about uh, 10 years of the vertical farm. Which is, uh, to, some extent, a, to yeah. some extent, a review of the 10th year anniversary edition of Dixon's book. Yes, right. on the vertical farm, where he has cool. an he has an he added an extra chapter, I think, about what what's happened in in the meantime. Yeah, it's very yeah. cool. Neat. I don't think he's going to sell his watercolors. Um, 
He's always said nobody would buy them, but now that he, but now that Kathy <laughs> yeah. announced them, people, yeah. a number of people I, want them. I know which ones I want to buy. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the thing he yeah. told me to go to his house and pick some for the uh, for the incubator. You know, he said he has too many to keep, but he has he has all other things. I mean, he has he has a lot of photographs as well. He has. I art. like his photographs of the flocks. His photos are great. By the, the way, let, let me show flies. you something here before we, we read on here. Look. So this is, um, which number do I do? Number two. So this is Big Sur, right? The Mac hmm. operating system. Um, and I really like these colors, right? So I commissioned Michelle Banks to make a virus collage in that palette. And she said, oh, that's a great idea. So let me give you a sneak peek. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> ah. Ooh. Ooh. Very, Very cool. nice. Isn't that cool? Very nice. Ah. So, I like it. So that's it's the palette, Big Sur palette. With, and, and she said, what do you want me to draw? I said, you're the artist. Just do it. Now, my original idea was to put this behind me. But... I don't know how to do it. I need some advice. Uh, Nails? Because here. No, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 Would that work? It would work. Like centered, yeah, sure. centered? Yeah. But, huh. Or off to the side a little bit like you were showing it. Because so, your head was, you know, and it was over on the side. Yeah. One, so. one way is it could be off to the side so people can see more of it. Or I could center it, in which case I would be sitting kind of in front of it. I don't know if that's that's weird. The third possibility is to get further away from the wall. So my desk is right now four feet uh, from the wall. I could push it forward a bit and maybe that would. So I have to experiment with these things anyway. Yeah. That's beautiful, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah. She's so good. The colors are just, and, and that palette really pops. Really yeah. pops out. Okay, now, Alan, you can go ahead and okay, now, take the, the opus. <laughs> okay, so Lise writes... Your discussion about Alfred Nobel's original bequest and how it differs from the norms of present-day Nobel Prize awards brings to mind a bit of science history, which may or may not have something to do with why present-day awards seldom get awarded soon after a major discovery. Did you know that Enrico Fermi got his Nobel Prize for a mistake? <laughs> the thing he got wrong was kind of significant. Everyone thought he had demonstrated, quote, the existence of new radioactive elements produced by neutron irradiation, end quote while actually the thing he had missed was nuclear fission. Here's the story behind that. Neutrons were first discovered in 1932. One of the ideas this inspired among physicists and chemists who specialized in radiation was the possibility of creating elements in the laboratory that had never been found in nature. It was already suspected that elements heavier than uranium could exist, but just hadn't been observed because those elements would be radioactive and any that once existed on Earth would have decayed long before there were scientists to discover them. Four different teams of scientists raced to be the first to generate those elements in the laboratory. Ernest Rutherford headed a team in the UK. Irene uh, Joliot-Curie headed a team in France. Enrico Fermi had the advantage because he had access to a richer uranium source than anybody else. The underdogs in that race were the team in Berlin, which despite the time and place was run by anti-Nazi Germans and a Jewish woman. It was that woman who figured out Fermi's mistake six weeks after he received his Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Lise Meitner was a physicist born and educated in Vienna. She moved to Berlin after getting her doctorate, and her earlier achievements included discovery of the atomic element protactinium-231. Life got difficult in the 1930s for obvious reasons, but her Austrian citizenship gave a measure of protection until Germany annexed Austria in 1938. <clears throat> Afterward, she escaped to the Netherlands on a midnight train carrying nothing but a weekend suitcase of belongings. From there, she settled in Sweden. Meanwhile, it looked like Fermi had won that scientific race she had been working on for several years. Yet in January of 1939, while she was taking a walk with her nephew, Otto Robert Fritsch, who was also a physicist, she mulled on the newest letter from her collaborator, chemist Otto Hahn, who was still working in Berlin. Hahn had isolated radioactive barium from the results of uranium bombardments, and he was confident that that uh, uh, he was confident that wasn't caused by sample contamination. Those results made no sense to Hahn at all. 
Together with her nephew, Meitner realized that barium might have resulted from fission of the uranium. And if that was correct, then they predicted krypton would also be present in the same sample, since the atomic numbers of krypton and barium would add up to the atomic number of uranium. Meitner and Frisch also realized those results would involve a slight loss of mass, which would mean a release of energy. They also worked out the possibility of a chain reaction. In other words, it was Meitner and Frisch who recognized the real-world applicability of Einstein's E equals mc squared equation. Reportedly, Niels Bohr's, re Niels Bohr's reaction to this finding was to slap his forehead and exclaim, what idiots we've been! For political reasons, it was impossible for Meitner and Frisch to share authorship on a paper with Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. The latter two were still working in Berlin. At the time when Meitner fled Germany, she had been on Himmler's shortlist for arrest just because of her ethnic background. So on 10 and 11 February 1939, Hahn and Strassmann published their chemistry results in one paper, and Meitner and Frisch published their physics calculations separately. The impact of those papers was spectacular. Frisch subsequently accepted an invitation to work in Los Alamos and later expressed regrets at how nuclear weapons were used at the end of the war. At the time, he thought his research would help stop Hitler. Fritz Strassmann's name is now inscribed on the Wall of Honor in the Garden of the Righteous, of the Righteous at Vadia Vashem, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Strassmann and his wife rescued a Jewish concert pianist from the Holocaust by hiding her in their Berlin apartment throughout the war. Otto Hahn received a solo Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1944. For the rest of his life, Hahn maintained that chemistry alone discovered nuclear fission. His private correspondence of 1938 and 1939 contradicts that claim. Lise Meitner turned down an, invita an invitation to Los Alamos because she refused to work on a bomb. In 1997, the atomic element number 109 was named Meitnerium in her honor, making her the first, and as far as I know, the only scientist who was active during the Nobel era, Nobel era who has an element named after them without also earning a Nobel Prize. Mistakes of that magnitude are probably missteps the Nobel Committee doesn't want to repeat. That might explain why scientific discoveries rarely get honored as swiftly as they used to several generations ago. Maybe they'll decide mRNA vaccine technology has proven itself definitively enough that it doesn't need to be evaluated with reticence. Cheers and thanks from a devoted TWIV listener, and if it's okay to suggest a listener pick, Ruth Lewin Symes' biography of Lise, uh, Lise Meitner, A Life in Physics, makes an excellent read. Best from Lise in Valle Vista, California. B.S. My father was a graduate student in physics when I was born and wanted to name his child after a scientist. So rather than do the, do the obvious thing and name me Marie, he chose another physicist nobody could spell. <laughs> it's great. That's wonderful. What a delightful letter. Thank yeah. you, Lise. That's it's wonderful. It's a really nice uh, follow up on my pick of Lisa Meitner last week and the <laughs> statue and her background and some of this. Um, I didn't have time to cover because it, it was just a pick of the week. But um, yeah, I knew that there was a biography. So it's nice to have that nice. put into the record as well. And for more follow-up on Lisa, we have Walter, right? This is a picture of the small hotel guest house in Kungla Kungal, Sweden, where Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch stayed during Christmas 1938 when uranium fission was discussed. The house is still there, but now a private residence. And there's a picture of a lovely little house. You know, lovely, quaint siding and roof and cobblestones, and then a plastic garbage can <laughs> next to it. <laughs> Got to put modern, it somewhere. Modern era. Like so many others, I have become a regular listener to TWIV since the corona outbreak and found your podcast educational and enjoyable. Since I live in Kungalv, I thought I should send this picture. I also send a close-up of the plaque on the wall, which in short tells the story in Swedish, German, and English. Kind regards, Walter. So cool. he also sent the picture of the plaque, which I assume is on the wall of the house, right? It looks like the same color. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. How cool. Yeah. Um, for those who might not have heard the episode the other week, or yet, I guess it was just whatever, one less than this number, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, 818, um, uh, Lisa Meitner was nominated 48 times for a Nobel Prize. 
Wow. And didn't get it. But she did get um, other awards and had a, an element named after her. So we talked a little bit about what the reasons for that were. And, and you have here that, you know, she wasn't part of that publication for those reasons. And the, the thoughts were that the, the Swedes who were deciding on the Nobel Prize didn't consider interdisciplinary work um, in a way that they should have. And they also probably didn't look outside of Sweden to have input on who should be considered, I think, in this case. More of the perils of crediting individual people or very, very small numbers of people with yeah. scientific progress. Kathy, can you take the next one? Yes. Lori writes, hello, my friends. 74 Fahrenheit, 23 Celsius, sunny with blue skies in Tombal, Texas. Wait. Wait, we we just uh, heard. Uh, yeah, she wrote. Us, oh, okay, that's the same person. Earlier. I thought, oh my gosh, is Tomball the new Budar? Are we huge in Tomball? No, it's the same person. Okay, same person. Today on my walk, I was listening to the Down Under episode of Twiv from 2014 and learned about retroviruses and chlamydia infection in koalas. During the interview, Peter Tim's work on testing a vaccine against chlamydia was mentioned, and your guest, Paul Young, said that he was working with Dr. Tim's to use the vaccination opportunity to test for a, co a koala retrovirus. What a great feeling it was when I got home, opened my mail from Nature Briefing, and saw that a chlamydia vaccine was being rolled out in Australia. Perfect timing to capture my interest. However, after reading the article, the first question that came to mind was, what about the retroviruses? So I did a search and found a review article from 2020 by Quigley and Tims and was able to find my answers there. Thanks to listening to TWIV and Virology Live, I was actually able to understand most of what I was reading. I really appreciate you guys and what you guys and gals do. You keep my, my retired brain happy. Thanks so much, Lori. Excellent. That's really cool. Yeah. Cool. Good timing. Rich. Brandon writes. Hey, Vincent Dixon, Rich, Kathy, Brianne, and Dr. Daniel. It's 21 degrees Celsius and a beautiful uh, clear blue sky here in Bluffton, South Carolina. And thank you all so much for the interesting and engaging and uh, informative podcast. I know almost nothing about virology, and lots of what I hear on TWIF goes right over my head. That doesn't matter as at all, as it's a real honor and a privilege just to hear y'all's conversations. Great. I love it. That's what we want to hear. Trying to stay up on COVID, I ran into episode 795 clinical update with Dr. Griffin. I subscribed and have been listening avidly ever since. And Vincent, I really enjoyed episode 815 with Moshi Artiti, Arditi uh, and Yvette Bihar about super engines. It was so fascinating. Getting a glimpse of what science is all about, hearing the truth as you all know it, and hearing when you all say you don't know something is so refreshing. There's so much BS everywhere. <laughs> that, uh, that's a show title. Uh, <laughs> thanks again for you all's hard work, and thanks for setting this 75-year-old mind on a new and amazing intellectual adventure. Oh, and Thor's Hammer is a great name for a pill. Brandon from Bluffton, South Carolina. Brandon, you are more than welcome. You are just exactly the kind of person uh, we uh, hope to reach. And uh, this is great. Awesome. Alan. Mark writes a question. Some patients seem to be poor responders to the vaccine. For example, Colin Powell. If you could predict that someone would be a poor vaccine responder, could you give them monoclonal antibodies after you vaccinate them to give them better protection? Mark in Jarvis, Ontario. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say Colin Powell was a poor responder to the vaccine. We know almost nothing about the details of what happened in his case. I will um, note that he's he was 84 years old, um, had been treated for multiple myeloma and was suffering from Parkinson's disease. And I don't know how the rest of his health was, um, you know, there, some people are still going to get very sick and are still going to die, even fully vaccinated against this virus. The vaccine gives you the absolute best chance of not having those bad outcomes, but nothing's a hundred percent. And 
you know, it's it's unfortunate that Colin Powell died. I disagreed with some of the things he did, but I I wholeheartedly supported who he was as a person. He was he was a great guy. Um, did a lot for the country, and that's sad. Um, I don't know how much longer he would have been around if it hadn't been for COVID nineteen. Um, but in terms of that, I, I don't think that's necessarily an example of a poor responder to the vaccine. Could you predict somebody would be a poor vaccine responder and give them monoclonals after you vaccinate them? Um, the monoclonals have become a first line treatment for people who are in the hospital now. Um, and they can be very effective if given early enough, is my understanding. Um, but as with the remdesivir story, if you get to the point where somebody's already in the ICU and then you're giving the monoclonals, well, it's not necessarily clear that's going to help. Um, and I'm not sure that if somebody's having a poor response to the vaccine, that monoclonals are going to really provide what they need. Um, but, you know, that's it is certainly an area of, of research where people want to know what level of response you get. And I think this has been looked at in people who are immunocompromised because of say, uh, being transplant recipients and they're on immunosuppressive drugs. They don't have much of an immune response to the vaccine because if they did, then their the immune system would recognize that their liver is not from around here and get rid of that. Um, so I, I think there is work going on on that and I don't know that we have any better, better answers. It's a good question for Daniel, whether monoclonals uh, in appropriate circumstances could be used prophylactically. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's, a, 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 except in situations where people are obviously either genetically or chemically immunosuppressed, um, I, I don't think you can predict who's going to be a good responder no. and who isn't. But I, I, I certainly, under those circumstances, uh, if I were in that circumstance, would not only want to be uh, real careful. I might even want to, uh, you know, if I could, after being vaccinated, maybe even follow up with some sort of antibody test to see whether I was responding or not. And regardless, uh, I would certainly, the minute I had any symptoms at all, would want to get a COVID test. And the same day, if I was positive, start monoclonals. Okay. Yeah. So that that's certainly a reasonable approach. Whether prophylaxis is a reasonable approach or not uh i don't know that that's a little more questionable I think. there have been some it, trials it, uh, regeneron's yeah. done some prophylaxis trials yeah okay you can but remember depending on which one you use it's a couple of months at best the there's there are some that are longer right so a year up to a year that last uh, which is remarkable so that would be okay i think this is part of the hope for molnupiravir right that maybe this patient popu this type of patient who's who's not going to be able to respond well to the vaccine could Treated. potentially take an antiviral on an ongoing basis. I, I don't think you would do that prophylactically, right? That's probably not a great idea. <laughs> I think I you don't just, know. I think you just want to. If you're not infected, it's probably best not to treat people. That's usually the okay. But I think if you are test positive, you immediately start molnupiravir, right? That's yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Kathy writes <laughs> and answers. Please, <Doctors>, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Some time ago, I read that Novavax was the only COVID vaccine that in no way relied on, involved, or touched on embryonic stem cells, and that it therefore would be a suitable vaccine for those claiming a religious exemption to vaccination. Is this true? And Kathy, the our Kathy has just pasted in. <laughs> But yeah, I pasted something in from a source that I don't really know anything about. But I I had Googled for um, is is Novavax free of embryonic cells or something like that. I forget what I Googled, um, and I got this hit that says Novavax and the Sanofi Pasteur are still in trials um, that do not use fetal cell lines in development. They're protein subunit vaccines. So this was back in January, and I don't remember what happened to the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine. I have the feeling it fell by the wayside, but it, yeah, it did so, in my mind anyway. 
last I last I heard of the Sanofi vaccine, they um, they were behind for various reasons, and they were talking about maybe doing comparative efficacy trials if they get to that point. Um, but they're still kind of off in the doldrums somewhere. Um, Novavax is is more current. Um, and I think you just talked about Novavax a little while ago on Twitter, right? Yeah. Yeah. The phase three results in the yeah. U.S. came out. Yeah. Also 818. Uh, yeah. Now, whether <laughs> whether um, whether that's actually going to get deployed to any extent, I don't know. Um, and in terms of those claiming a religious exemption to vaccination, um, some of that group may be persuaded to get vaccinated with Novavax. I don't know. Um, some of that group may be claiming a religious exemption, but they actually just, you know, don't want to, or they're afraid of shots, or so. I'm I'm not sure how much the how much effect that's actually going to have. Um, but yeah, my understanding of the way the Novavax vaccine is made is that it may not trigger this particular objection. Um. Now I'm reading a little bit more. Uh, so the uh, the Sanofi uh, uh, vaccine we're talking about is their protein vaccine, right? Yes. According to the New York Times uh, vaccine tracker, that's in phase three trials. Okay. Uh, and uh, same as the Novavax, um, it's uh, uh, produced in insect cells. Yeah, so they would not have to use other cells right. in, in the development of that. They could just use insect cells. But I, now, I, with some I, of these, uh, yeah. Because right. I, I would have to look at the paper uh, because if you look at the Moderna paper, for example, they use 293 cells and um, they state it clearly in the early development, right? But uh, I, did, I haven't done that for Novavax. So I would just say it, it wouldn't be necessary could be that that's correct, right? Um, it, it looks like in something else I've found that it's possible that Novavax used fetal stem cells in some of their testing. Hmm. But again, I, I don't, I can't vouch for any of these Did sources. We, um, and it's, it's certainly built on research that has used uh, yeah. various embryonic for cells. Sure, sure. You, you could find a reason to you argue could, against it. You could them, certainly sure. find a reason. Although, you know, if it's made in insect cells, I know crickets are kosher. Um, so that may... Uh, that may help sway some people. Um, we had, I don't believe we uh, ever did the paper on the Novavax development. Mm. So I would, we would have to go back and look at it. Get, uh, well. Matt Freeman. Actually, Maybe Matt yeah, Freeman. get Matt Freeman on. He, uh, he so, might just know. Okay. So uh, just uh, one more thing. Uh, December 11th, 2020. Sanofi and GK, uh, GSK announced that uh, their vaccine, which is called Vidprevtin, was proving disappointing. Yeah. Uh, in January, uh, Sanofi decided to help Pfizer and BioNTech make 100 million doses of their vaccine. Right. Uh, they reached a similar agreement with Johnson & Johnson. Meanwhile, Sanofi developed a stronger formulation uh, of Vidprevtin. Um, launched a new phase uh, two trial in February. Uh, the new version is uh, showing good immune responses and they started a new phase three. Be interesting okay. to know what the difference is. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be at change? all surprised if, uh, you know, Edgevent had something to do with this. We'll see. So I'm looking at the phase one, two Novavax paper, New England Journal. Simply made the spike and they put it into a vector and put it in insect cells. Um, I, you know, you can imagine that they, there were some things that they wanted to do, but in, in uh, mammalian cells, but it wouldn't be necessary, right? Wouldn't be necessary in this case. No. In the case of the mRNA vaccines that use cells uh, in culture to uh, express mm -hmm. the protein from the mRNA. So that, uh, that's obvious. The only way I can see with a Novavax thing would be really peripheral, and that is you yeah. could you might want to test serum for virus neutralization, but heck, you'd do that on Vero cells. So 
Uh, I, I don't see any reason why they'd use fetal cells. And by the way, for anybody out there who's interested, when I get uh, questions about the status of a vaccine, I go straight to the New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker. It's really good. Uh, and that's where I got all that stuff about Sanofi. So I, uh, I'm working my way back in the reference <laughs> from that <laughs> keep it. Yeah. <laughs> so here's uh, Spike, sp uh, the vaccine candidate, NVXCOV2373, and immunogenicity in baboons and protection in mice. So let's take a very quick look at the methods section and see, okay, Vero cells were used. Um, they are not fetal cells. They are not fetal cells. That was uh, I don't even I don't even know why it was used. The constructs were tested and optimized for expression in uh, insect cells. Um, you would use vero cells if you wanted to do some sort of uh, virus neutralization assay. You'd want to use yeah. uh, do, do a cell culture assay for virus infectivity. Okay, and you'd use yeah. vero cells. Right. So that's those are the only two cells in this paper which is the first animal study of the, uh, the vaccine. So and um, I can imagine that you might want to, let me just say what, what they say, excuse me, about the actual vaccine. Mm, the spike, blah, 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 blah. We have developed a subunit vaccine from S, uh, and that's it. They don't reference it. So I, I would probably say not, but... No. Who knows? All right, it's time for some picks of the week. Kathy, what do you have for us? Well, recently I went to Cleveland, which is where I grew up, and there are a lot of really good museums there. I went straight to the Cleveland um, Art Museum, um, but then on another day I went to the Great Lakes Science Center, which is my pick. And it's home to the NASA Glenn Visitor Center, so there's some cool uh, stuff there that, um, you know, in the absence of being at the Air and Space Museum, you get to see just a little of it and you can focus on what's there instead of being overwhelmed by tons of stuff. Um, so there's lots of hands-on exhibits, um, lots of sinks and um, hand-washing stations <laughs> and um, <laughs> things like that, which I'm sure were there before the pandemic. Um, and they have refurbished the Dome Theater. There's lots of activities. So I can't remember when the Science Center was built, but it's right on Lake Erie. And it's um, between the Brown Stadium and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so uh, I made a day of going to the Science Center and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, both of which I'd been to before. Um, but I had lunch there at the Great Lakes Science Center, and they had just this awesome pizza. So I highly recommend that. It's not what you expect for a museum cafe no. in any way. But um, you, can, you can park in one place and go to both the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Science Center, or you can take public transportation there. Um, the only warning is that the um, Science Center is closed on the day of Browns games because it's just on the other side, just steps away. So their parking deck is a major place for a Brown's parking. Anyway, uh, if you're going to Cleveland um, to go to any one of those things, you might check out some of the other ones. This looks great. The, uh, I'm looking at the uh, Glenn, uh, what is it? Glenn, the NASA Glenn Visitor Center, and they have a space that they call, uh, the gallery they call the Living in Space Gallery that looks mm -hmm. different yes. than what I've seen before. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, when astronauts get to space, how do they eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom? Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It, it, was, it was, yeah. Uh, whenever I go to a science museum, you can count on me being there for several hours and longer than almost anybody else can tolerate. So I was by myself. It was fine. And they have a, well, we ought to go ship. to a museum. We ought to go to a museum together then, Kathy, because usually my family abandons me because <laughs> I have yeah. to read everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and they, they have a everything. they have a huge um, they have a steamship, mm -hmm. they have a Great Lakes freighter. That's huh. cool. Yeah. Cool. I love maritime nice. museums too, but but yeah, the science museum aspect of this looks awesome. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I don't think I've picked this before, but I have discussed this with you guys. It's just a short article <laughs> uh, that uh, came up after we just got our new cat. 
um, who likes to, as cats do, it's part of their job, walk across your keyboard. And I was looking for a quick way to disable my keyboard so that the cat wouldn't, uh, you know, log me out of TWIV. Uh, nice. And it turns out there's this little script that you can uh, download uh, and install uh, where all it takes is control, alt, control, alt, L, L for lock, and it locks your keyboard. Okay. So that when you see the cat coming, uh, you can do this. So I got this keyboard. on my keyboard now. <laughs> That's funny. And if you want to get out, you type unlock. Uh, nice. And that and that does it. So uh, th there are several other of these sorts of things, but I thought this was amusing and it works. It works great. That's great. And of course, just as you're talking about this, Alan's cat is walking around. In the yes, Suki, Suki just <laughs> got up. She decided it's, it's time to walk She heard around. the word cat being mentioned. Yeah. Yes. Well, the episode's getting a little long, you know, the cat. <laughs> you know. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book of essays. Um, this is How to Make a Slave and Other Essays by Gerald Walker. Um, so this is, uh, he's, he's a writer. He's a fantastic writer. He's, um, uh, and I, I really, occasionally, I like to just tuck into a book of essays because they're, they're, you know, usually if you get a really good writer doing essays, they'll be bite-sized things that you can just sink into and, and, really get something out of. Um, and he writes about the the African-American experience, the Black experience in America. He's um, basically my generation, so a lot of what he's writing about, I it, it resonates in a strange way because obviously as a white guy growing up, I had very different experiences and it was just a neat set of insights and as I say, really well written um, and I highly recommend giving it a try cool and it's not it's this is not some you know you should feel guilty about being white type of thing he he is just the way he he approaches this and the perspective that he has on it is just incredibly insightful and and useful and greatly appreciated cool. and very positive good all right so i'm continuing my uh 10 in uh, alan uh I started Friday. I'm inspired by Dixon's 10 comedians. So I'm picking 10 seminal papers in molecular nice. biology. So today's paper was published in the April 25th, 1953 issue of Nature. I was four months old at the time. <laughs> it is a structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid. And this, of course, is it's the paper by Watson and Crick, and it's one page yep. with no data. <laughs> There's just what they think DNA looks like. It's a drawing, a diagram of the double helix. And they say, well, you know, we'll publish the, the data later, <laughs> which I think is so funny, right? Um, but the, the, the paper, you should read it. it uh, you know, it's been talked about a lot, of course. And yeah. Of course, they... They took x-rays that Rosalind Franklin had made and and uh, used them. Um, I, I don't know if they ever collected any data themselves. They just looked at other people's pictures and uh, made, made little cardboard models. Anyway, a few things in this paper. Of course, f figuring out the structure of DNA is huge because it's a duplex and there's specific base pairing, which leads to our understanding of uh, how it, it replicates. Which did not escape their notice. Yes, and of course, it the the very famous sentence uh, towards the uh, towards the it's end the of the last this, sentence of the paper. Last sentence of the yeah. paper. Is it the last sentence of the paper? Um, mm -hmm. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying me mechanism for genetic material. Full details will be published later, <laughs> but uh, it's very interesting. The little people will take care of the details. So, yes. They say, in the beginning, a structure for nucleic acid has been proposed by Pauling and Corey, and they made their manuscript available to us. It has three chains, <laughs> not two. And they say, in our opinion, this structure is unsatisfactory <laughs> for two reasons, and they Give the reasons. And then they say another three-chain structure has also been suggested by Fraser and Press. In that model, the phosphates are on the outside. This structure is rather ill-defined, and for this reason, we shall not comment on it. <laughs> it's just so buried criticism. It's just yes. amazing. And so 
they came up with this idea that it is a double strand with the bases on the inside. And of course, you know, G is pairing with C and A is pairing with uh, T. And that, of course, was previously determined by Shargoff, right? Shargoff's rules that and which I point out here, it's been found experimentally, the ratio of the amounts of A and T and G and C are always very close to unity for DNA. So Shargoff made a big um, contribution to this, which I guess Pauling and Corey uh, ignored in <laughs> putting a triple helix together. So I, mean, I know that they cut out the bases and said, oh, they have to fit this way, A, T, and G, C, and that's how it works and so forth. So it's an important paper. There's a lot of controversy behind it, of course, but in the in the scheme of molecular biology, um, this really begins the modern era uh, where we understand not only that this, we know this is genetic material already from 1944, but uh, how it's going to reproduce. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a rather important paper. Yeah. One, one of the interesting things for me is uh, how long the path is from there to the genetic code. Uh, it's another 10 years. Uh, yes. and, and the, the notion uh, it's, I think, I don't think it's in this paper, but the, a subsequent paper where they actually publish the data where they say that, you know, we think maybe that the sequence of bases is some kind of code. Yes. Or the for the yeah. sequence of amino acids and proteins, but they they really sort of tread really lightly on that, and it was it was not obvious uh, in the beginning, and it was a long path from there to the code. Yeah. Now, they, the Watson Crick, of course, received the Nobel Prize in 1962. It was nine years, and er Erling Norby talked about this uh, because you know he has seen the archives. And he said, basically, people wanted to make sure it was right on the committee. And they waited for other people to uh, validate the, the results. And it turned out to be right. But it took uh, nine years to do that. So so this paper and, and last time, is they're both uh, recognized by uh, Nobel Prizes, which is not a necessarily a criteria that I have for seminal discovery. But, of course, the Nobel Prizes are supposed to recognize seminal discoveries. So, um, speaking of yep. science museums, um, mm -hmm. the Science Museum in London has some of the pieces of their model. Ooh, uh, is that right? That, yeah. Uh, so being a geek, I spent a lot of time at that cool. museum. Which too. museum cool. is that? Uh, London Science Museum. I put the link in just below Vincent's page. Oh, that's cool. I've never been Very there. Cool. Oh, yeah. It's a good one. We have two listener picks. Uh, Stephen writes, I heard you folks discussing a musical analogy to how the immune system works. Recently, Kurzgesagt, which has been discussed on Twitter before, produced a video titled How the Immune System Actually Works, Immune. <laughs> and it's a YouTube video. He links to it. It's a Goldilocks video. Not too complicated and not too simple, but just right. Perhaps you could share this as a listener pick. I discovered your channel in the early days of the pandemic while looking for reliable sources on SARS-CoV-2 and have been listening ever since. Thanks, Steve. And the, the video starts out with a typical immunology slide with a billion cells and lines joining them all over the place. <laughs> and then says, wait a minute, step back. Uh, and of course, our other pick is from Lisa, who uh, is picking uh, Ruth uh, Lewin-Symes biography, Lisa Meitner. Thank you, cool. Steve and Lisa. And that's TWIV819 on the 19th of October. There you go. Show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us, uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com on Twitter. He's Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>